So, all right. Now, Haggai. Let's get, finally get to business here. Haggai. Haggai, we have three minor prophets left. Uh, <laughs> we've been going through the minor prophets, and we have three left. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And these three prophets now are what are considered post-exile prophets. Okay, how many people know what that means? If you know the history of the Old Testament, of the Jews in the Old Testament, because of their disobedience, especially the, the Jews were focusing particularly on Jerusalem now, which would be the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Because of their disobedience, because they worshipped other gods and worshipped idols, God told them through the prophets, he, he, he begged them to come back to him, and they, and they refused to do it. So he let them go into captivity for how many years? How many people know how many years? Hmm? No. It, captivity in Babylon. Seventy. Seventy years. Captivity. That was prophesied. At the end of that 70 years, God allowed them to go back to Jerusalem. Uh, and what had happened, and we, we talked about this when we were, we were uh, studying the prophet Daniel, that the Babylonian Empire had got to a place where uh, the leadership had really gotten bad. And the Medo-Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire. And we talk about that, how they, how they uh, blocked the river and were able to come in under the wall. And if you read in Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 6, where they were having a feast and they were mocking the God of the Jews, and the handwriting was on the wall, you remember that? Uh, and uh, Belteshazzar, who was the king of Babylon at that time, called for Daniel to read the writing. And Daniel said, your days are numbered and you're found wanting. And uh, your, your, uh, your kingdom has been weighed and found wanting and your days are numbered. And that's when the Medes and Persians came in. Now, the prophet Isaiah, a hundred or so years before this, prophesied that there would be a king named Cyrus who would allow the Jews to go back to Jerusalem after they conquered the Babylonian Empire. And indeed that happened. In the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, <laughs> you read of, of the return to Jerusalem. In different, they didn't all go back at once. They went back in different, different uh, phases. The first return uh, was in about 538 B.C. And these, these years are kind of spotty They're because we really don't know. It's very difficult to pinpoint exactly things when they happened that, that long ago. But about 538 B.C., uh, Ezra chapter 1 through 6, uh, the first group of people went back to Jerusalem under the command of King Cyrus. Uh, their leader, they had a leader named Zerubbabel, which means um, uh, Babylon provides or Babylon protects. I can't remember exactly the name of that. But Zerubbabel was their, was their government leader, and they had a priest named Joshua who went back with him. Uh, about uh, 70 years later, at 458 B.C., uh, in Ezra chapter 7 and 10, Ezra went back with a group of people under King Artaxerxes. And then, about 450, uh, 445, Nehemiah returned with a group of people to rebuild the wall. When they first went back, their, their job was to rebuild the temple. And when Nehemiah came, his job was to rebuild the wall around the city. Haggai was a prophet uh, around 530 B.C., uh, the second year of Darius Hystapes, one of the kings. Uh, the Jews had returned from Babylon with Zerubbabel, and they began to reconstruct the temple, but the reconstruction stalled out. Because what had happened is they began to reconstruct the altar and so forth and the things that they would need to worship God. Some of the people around them began to oppose them. The Samaritans who lived in that land at that time, who didn't, they weren't too thrilled about the fact that these Jews were coming back. They wrote a letter to the king and they said, you know, if you let these Jews build their temple again, they're going to rebel against you. So the king told them to stop building the temple. And that, uh, that went for a little while. He revoked his permission, but then it was granted again by his grandson, uh, whose name was Darius. So we read here in Haggai, a situation where the prophet, God sent the prophet to the people who had, they started to rebuild the temple, but then they, they left off, okay? So starting with Haggai chapter 1, 
And we're just going to read a few verses. It's basically divided into uh, <laughs> to four different parts here. It's only two chapters long, so it's not a long book. But the first, chap- uh, the, the first part from chapter 1, really all of chapter 1, is called Consider Your Ways. Okay. The second part from chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, talks about the return of God's glory. From verse 10 to verse 19 in chapter 2, uh, there were religious questions. And then in the last part of chapter 2, we talk about the reign of of the Lord. So we see Haggai looking again like many of the prophets did at his situation that was going on at that time, but we also see God showing him things that were to happen centuries and millennia in the future. So let's start chapter one and just read a little bit. There's not much to read. It says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. Uh, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek. Now this Zerubbabel, if you read the genealogy of Jesus Christ, he is a part of that genealogy. So he was in the line of David. Okay. says verse 2, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. The people were saying, you know, they started it, but they just couldn't seem to get themselves restarted. You ever start something and, and don't finish it, and you start it, and then you look at it for like the next three years and say, boy, i got to finish this. It's like I was cleaning my room up. I started cleaning my little room up, and I got about a third of the way there, and I stalled out, you know. So now every time I walk in, I look at it and say, one of these days I'm going to have to finish this job. Well, that's the way it was with the temple. They began to, to, to build, rebuild the temple, and they, and they got this opposition, so they stopped. But instead of trying to find a way to start up again, they just kind of laid back. And it says in verse 3, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and in, in this house lie waste? He says, you know, you're building your houses. You're taking care of your stuff. You're taking care of where you live. Don't you think it's time you look after the house of the Lord? Don't you think it's time you look after the rebuilding of the temple? Because that is the most important thing. The temple was the center of worship in Israel. It was the center of worship in Jerusalem. He says, you've built your houses. You've taken care of your property. Now what about mine? In other words, they were neglecting, they were neglecting, the worship of Yahweh. They were neglecting what God had called them, the reason why God had allowed them to come back to Jerusalem was to reestablish true worship. And instead, they were just building their own houses. Okay. It says this. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. And all through these, reading these minor prophets, I have always said, you know, it was, it's as pertinent today as it was back then. Because today we're not so concerned with buildings. You know, we are to a certain extent. It's nice to have a building to meet in, so, you know, we're out of the rain. But I think what's more important is not so much this building, but this building. Because this is now what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. See, there's always a picture, there's always a, 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 a message, there's always a lesson in all these. People say, well, that was thousands of years ago. But it, the same God and the same situation exists today. Sometimes we're, we're so, so enthralled with all the stuff around us, you know, in the natural, but we're not so, you know, we don't really care too much about what's going on in the spiritual. And I want to tell you something, the spiritual is more important way more important than the natural. It's nice to have nice stuff, but what's so much more important is that is we need to have our spiritual house in order. Because that's the only thing that's going to go with us when we go on to eternity. All the stuff around us, we're not going to take with us, okay? So let's read what he has to say. He says, consider your ways, verse 6. Now, check this out. He says, listen, you've sown much and you're bringing little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with with drink. 
You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earns wages, earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. You ever find yourself wondering where the money goes at the end of the month? You ever find yourself trying and struggling and working, and it just seems like you don't have anything to show for it? Maybe, just maybe, you got the wrong priority. Maybe you're working on, on, on the wrong house. Because he's telling these people, you know, you're doing, you're working, you're planting, and you're not reaping. You're drinking, but you're not getting full. You're eating, but you're not getting full. Maybe, maybe you should consider your ways and what your priorities are. Their priority was not the house of God. It was not the temple. Their priority was all the other stuff. They started, they had good intentions, but well, we'll get to that when the time comes. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 7, Consider your ways. Well, what a thing to preach on. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, says the Lord. God says, listen, go ahead. Go get some wood. I'll build my house. Build my, build my temple. Work on the important thing. Your relationship with me. Because the temple was where they met God. It wasn't just the altar. It was the temple. It was the holy place and the holiest place. All those things that he had commanded Moses to do. That was where he met his people. Now listen. Where do people meet God today? In a building like this? No. They meet God right here. They see God in the people that are called by his name. We're the temple. We're the place. We're the holy place. He says, verse 9, You looked for much, and it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew upon it. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. Everybody's doing their own thing. Everybody's worried about their own agenda. Everybody's worried about their own reputation. How many of us really care that people see God in us? See, this is for today as much as it was for them. There's a whole lot of folks running around that don't care if people see God in them. You know, how do we act around other people? I mean, do I, show, do I show the Lord? Especially when somebody does me wrong, somebody cuts me off, or somebody gives me a dirty look. Or, do, I, do I show them Jesus? I'm the temple. He says, Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I call for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground brings forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Man, when things, when the economy is tanking, maybe it's because we've turned our back on God. As a nation, as individuals, as a nation. Huh? The important things, the things of God are important. I'm not just talking about a building that's called a church. I'm talking about this building, not made with hands. I'm talking about this temple. The most important, the, the biggest priority we ought to have, every one of us, is that people see Christ in us. That people see Jesus in us. In how we live, how we talk, how we treat other people. The way we the way we handle ourselves around other people. I was talking to uh, a couple that had asked me if I would consider marrying them. And I was sitting down with them, counseling them. And I said, marriage is work. It's hard work. you got to work at it. How many people know what I'm talking about? It doesn't just happen. I mean, you know, it does, love and romance, that's great. But you got to work at it. And just as people, husbands and wives have to work at being married, sometimes we have to work real hard. We have to work at, Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. They had to work to build the temple. Get some wood, get the, get, the, get the stuff you need and build this temple. We have to work at that. We as believers, we have to work at our relationship with God. Not to be saved, we can't work to be saved. And if, we, if it's not important for us to work our, our salvation with fear and trembling? Well, you know, everything else is just going to kind of flatline until God gets our attention. Just like he was trying to do right here. 
Now look what happened. Look at the response. Look at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, what did they do? Obeyed the voice of the Lord. They said, all right. They got the message. They obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, in the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. They listened, they obeyed, and they did what God told them to do. Now, a lot of people read this, and they'll talk about, you know, every church needs stuff. This isn't about working in the church. I mean, it's important we do that. You know, we all have a calling. We all have a purpose. But this is about this temple. This is about this thing. This is where, this is where God dwells. This is where the Holy Spirit dwells. If we hear God's voice and we're obedient, God will bless. He'll bless. We'll see an increase. We'll see We'll see that, you know, we'll work and we'll have something to show for. We'll see God bless. We'll see things happen the way we desire to see him happen. All we need to do is be obedient to his voice. Okay? Now, that's the first part of Haggai. That's the foundation. They came back. They started the good work. They, they stopped. And if, if historically, they say that the, 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 second, the second temple, it's considered the second temple, was dedicated around... Uh, 516 B.C. So it was about uh, 32 years or so in the building from the, the time they came back. It took them a while to build the temple. But they did it. They were obedient. Now listen to what God had to say because of their obedience in chapter 2. Starting at verse 1. <clears throat> now, and this is all he's, all, he's giving time frames for this. So this is like history. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of, I wish they quit, I can't pronounce that name, Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? God is saying, Okay, guys, now we're building the temple. You got this temple built. How many people, if you read in the Old Testament, when Solomon built his temple, it was laid out. I mean, it was like gold and silver and massive. And if, if, I forget how many billions of dollars it would cost to build the same thing today. It was laid out. And it says, if you read in Ezra, it says that when they built this second temple, the ones who were really old, well, when, when they dedicated the second temple, there was a lot of crying going on. Some of the younger ones were crying because, wow, we got our temple. But the older ones were crying because the second temple wasn't nothing compared to the first. Some of them cried because of what they had lost. Some of them cried because of what they had that never had before. He says, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of nothing? As of nothing. Did you ever think about this? And, and you know, I, I, I think of times, I look back in my life, in my Christian life. I was saying this Sunday, when you first get saved, man, you get, you see God move. Huh? See God move and just things just. And then you get hit with a two by four. Boom. It's like. Then it's like, and then it seems like everything after that is just nothing. It seems like it's just nothing. It's just, you know, I can remember saying, oh, Lord, I wish it was like it when I first got saved. Anybody ever say that? You know what? I want to, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. Nothing that God does is any better or worse than anything he's ever done. You hear what I'm saying? This second temple wasn't nothing like that first one. 
But it was just as valuable. It was just as important. It was as much a place of meeting as it was in Solomon's day. See, it's not the grandeur. It's not the gold and the silver. It's the spirit. It's the spirit. You know, sometimes you look at folks, and this is like, you know, we talk about this temple. Man, there's some folks that know how to dress this temple up. You know, got them $1,000 suits going, jet airplanes, big buildings with lots of people in them. And there's other folks out on the street, sometimes with blue jeans and tattered clothes. Is one any better than the other? What makes, what makes the temple worthwhile? It's not what's on the outside. It's not the gold and the silver. It's what's on the inside. He says, he says, listen. He says, it's, is it not in your eyes in comparison as of nothing? Verse 4. Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel. Don't look at the outside. Be strong, says the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord. See, that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter if you have a, a billion-dollar billing or a shack. God, if, listen, if the Spirit is there, God is with you. That's the message. That second temple didn't look like nothing. But you know what happened over the years, over the hundreds of years after this? A fellow came along named Herod, King Herod. King Herod was Idumean. He was a descendant of Edom. And he became the king of Israel. Not the real king, not God's king, but he was, the Romans made him king of Israel. And you know what he did? He built a temple just like Solomon's. He built that temple in Jesus' day, Herod's temple, was probably as glorious, maybe even more so than Solomon's was. Because Herod, man, he, went, he, didn't, went, he didn't do anything halfway. So he built this great, gigantic temple with gold and silver and the whole nine yards for the people. Yeah, for the people, for himself. You know what Jesus did when he went in that temple? He didn't look around and say, man, what a great temple. He kicked out the money changers. He cleaned the place up. That temple became a den of thieves. That's, the spirit was no more in that temple than it was in anything. Why? Because it was glorious on the outside. See, that was considered the second temple. It was glorious on the outside, but it was wicked and dead on the inside. So it's not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside that counts. He says, I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Fear ye not. My spirit is here. It's not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside. God, if God's spirit is in it, it doesn't matter what it looks like. Because God's spirit is there. For thus says the Lord of hosts in verse 6, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. See, now he's looking, he's looking on now. He's looking in the future now. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. He's saying it might not look, look like much, but my glory is going to fall on this in a greater way than it ever fell on Solomon's temple. And you remember when Solomon first dedicated his temple, if you read back there in the Old Testament. Man, there was so much glory there, they couldn't stand up. That place filled up with smoke and everybody was getting slain in the spirit. God said, this one might not look like one-tenth of what Solomon's was. But I'm going to bless it with my spirit like I've never blessed it. And I want to tell you something. You might not look like some great preacher, but God will give you a measure of the spirit greater. He said, he said in, Jesus said in his day that John the Baptist was, was the greatest man that ever lived. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Why? Because we got something without measure that John didn't have. We got access to the Holy Ghost. When that Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, he gave us something that these folks back here only wish they could have had, like we had. Back then, you know, the Holy Spirit would move uh, on different people at different times for specific purposes. Now, he fills believers all the time. We have an unlimited access to him. 
He says, I'll shake all nations in verse 7, and the desire of all nations shall come. Who's the desire of all nations? Jesus Christ. He's looking forward to the second coming of Christ. He's coming back to Jerusalem. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. I'll fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. It doesn't look like much, but it's going to be greater, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. In that place where they built that second temple, it didn't look like much. But I'm telling you, in that very same mountain, there's going to be a temple built sometime where Jesus himself is going to sit. They ain't there yet. But they're working on it. They're making, they're making the golden lampstands. They're making all the, the snuffers and the shovels and the altars. They're building. There's a, there's a bunch over there. They're, just, they're looking for a red heifer. But they need to, to purify the priest. They're getting ready. They got the garments ready. They got the cups ready. They got everything ready. They're ready for that third temple. Because that's where Christ is going to come back. Now, look at the next section. Talked about the promise. He blessed them. He's saying Christ is coming. The, the glory of God, the desire of the nations are coming. The, gladder of, uh, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. Verse 10. Look at this. In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month. Now here's, here's the next section. In the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law. Now, now he, he poses a question. So here we have the temple, rebuilt temple, altar, worship, priesthood, back in Jerusalem, restored after 70 years of captivity. He says, let me ask you a question. If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage of wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? In other words, is holiness contagious? And the answer is no. It's not. If, if a priest walking by and he's holy and he rubs up against something, does that automatically become holy? No. Uh-uh. It's not. But listen to what he says. Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. What's the message here? Here's the message. If I give you a bottle of water and say, hey, you want some water? You say, yeah, and drink the water. But if I put two drops of sewage in it, yes. want to drink? Uh, no, thanks. Unless you were really thirsty. Right? No, thanks. Why? Because holiness isn't contagious, but unholiness is. See, that, that temple that they built, what Haggai was saying is, listen, this is, this is holy ground. It'll be, if you let something unholy in, it'll be defiled. That's what happened before the captivity. They brought the unholy into the holy and it defiled it. How many people know that if you allow yourself to rub elbows with the unholy without a specific purpose of preaching the gospel, if you just kind of hang out, there's a, whole, there's a bigger chance that you're going to get unholy than they're going to get holy just by you being there. That's why you got to watch out who you hang out with. That's why you got to watch out what, what, you, what, you, know, what you spend. You know, if, if I turn on the TV or if I turn on the Internet and I look at something filthy, I'm not going to make it holy by looking at it. It's going to defile me. See, this, we, got, we possess this temple. We're supposed to possess this temple in holiness. That means separation from the defiling things of the world. That doesn't mean we're supposed to lock ourselves in a room somewhere and never, never rub shoulders. You know, we have to deal with the people. That's how, we, that's how we present the gospel to those who are lost. We go out and we tell them the truth. But we're not supposed to jump in with them. You, you understand what I'm saying? See, there's folks today that teach, well, you just jump in with them, man, you'll just get them holy. You know, invite them to church. A lot of churches people invite them to, they just come in. It's the same thing as they get out there. Nothing... So it's a religious question about holiness. 
Verse 14. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands and that which they offer there is unclean. And now I pray you, consider from this day and upward from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days were, when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the press fat to draw 50 vessels out of the press, there were but 20. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands, yet you turn not to me. He said, listen, to all the problems that you're having is you don't take holiness seriously. And again, we wonder why sometimes we find ourselves in the middle, scratching our heads saying, oh God, what's going on? It's because maybe we have not or maybe we have allowed ourselves to become defiled with the things of the world. This is why it says, come out from among them and be not partakers with him. Because the things of the world, you're not going to make them holy just by being there. They'll defile you. This temple, they defiled the temple in their day. And man, how many of us defile our temple? He said, consider from this day and upward, from the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month in verse 18, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yet, yea, and yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree has not brought forth from this day will I bless you. He's saying, listen, get holy, get right. He called his people out from Egypt. He wanted them to be a peculiar, special people. Set apart for him. He wanted the the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, to be a picture to the rest of the world of how holy he was. And if he wanted that for them, you know what? He wants that from us. This idea of what the world sees in us is so important. There's one more section. And here's the glorious section. It says this. And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. How many people know a shaking is coming? See, he was looking here way beyond his time. He was looking beyond the time of Christ. He was looking beyond our time. Now, now he's getting a picture of something that is yet to come. A shaking. We're, it's starting even today. We see little shaking going on in the world here and there. Not just earthquakes, but stuff, turmoil in the world, confusion in the world, things being turned upside down. He says, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And listen to this. And I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. And I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. Remember Psalm number two. Why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. I'll, the, I'll, the smart bombs, the tanks, the helicopters, the, the supersonic jets, uh, the, the, the nuclear weapons, I'm going to, di- I'm going to di- disarm and disable every one of them. Instead, everybody, I'll have the armies turning on each other. And we saw that happen in the Old Testament. Remember when, when uh, Jerusalem was surrounded? And Hezekiah called unto God and said, God. See, there was a letter. They wrote a letter to him. They said what they was going to do to him. And Hezekiah said, God, do you read this letter? Prophet Isaiah said, don't worry. They ended up killing each other. Last verse, and we're going to close. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatel, says the Lord, I will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, says the Lord of hosts. Well, you know what? Zerubbabel died a long time ago. But Zerubbabel was in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm going to take you and make a signet. You know what a signet is? It was a ring that the king wore. And whenever the king would pronounce a judgment or make a law or say something, he would take that signet and put wax on it and he would seal it with that signet. Do you know in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the seven-sealed book, 
You've heard me talk about that before. You know, the picture is of a scroll. Let me roll it up. And there are seals on the scroll. Seven seals marked with a signet. In those days, if somebody was going to leave a will, you know, today when you leave a will, you, you get it typed up and you get it notarized and you send it to Greensburg and they register it. Well, in those days when somebody left a will, they would, they would write it and they would, they would roll it up and they would seal it with a signet. And the only one who had the right to open up those seals was the one that owned that ring. That's why in the Revelation, when it said that, you know, who can open up the book? Nobody had the right to open Nobody had the signet except one. Christ was God's signet. He had the right to open up the title deed to the earth. The seven seals. Haggai says, listen. He's talking to Zerubbabel, but Zerubbabel died a long time ago. But Zerubbabel was a type of his offspring named Jesus Christ. And the day is coming. Haggai is looking way in the future. The day is coming when God is going to shake the heavens and the earth. And he's going to send his son. He'll be a signet. And he'll come and he'll open up the seals. And he'll establish the kingdom of God on the face of this earth. That's what I'm looking forward to. And that's why I want to be ready. See, that's why I want to take care of this temple. That's why I want to be concerned about people seeing Jesus in this temple. I I want people to see the righteousness of God. I want people to see the holiness of God. I want want people to see me reflect who he is. I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants for all the people that name his name as their Lord and Savior. He's not just worried about what it looks like on the outside, but he's worried about the spirit being on the inside. That's why he says, it's not by might or by power, but by my spirit. That, that's in the next prophet. By my spirit, says the Lord. God, my prayer is that the spirit of God would dwell in our hearts. That we would possess these temples in holiness. Oh, we could go into the New Testament. We could go over there to 1 Corinthians where it said, or 2 Corinthians where it says, Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? It's not that late. Let's look at it. Turn turn to 2 Corinthians. It's not snowing tonight, is it? Okay. Look look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And, and verse 14. It's not the one I was thinking of, but that's the one we'll read. He says this. Be ye not unequally yoked together with what? Unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. So there ought to be a difference between Christians in the world. There ought to be a difference. I'm not saying we're, we got to be high and mighty. I'm not saying we got to act weird. I'm saying there got to be a difference. There's got to be a change. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Consider your ways, Haggai said. Take account of this temple. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Build the temple of God, the place where the world can meet him. Amen. Any questions or questions?